Hi everybody! In this short lecture, I introduce the important idea that the force is minus the gradient of the potential. Now, my first day in undergraduate physics, I was um, at an orientation kind of class uh, when I started, and my professor came to the front of the room and he introduced himself. He did all this, you know, kind of intro stuff. And then he said, okay, I'm going to tell you the most important equation in physics, and we're all going to chant it together. And I want you to remember this moment. And I really have, it's very odd that I have, that he made us chant the force is minus the gradient of the potential. And he did the little conducting hands the whole time he did it. He made us chant it like five times. So if you want to pause the video and chant that sentence five times, maybe you'll remember that the force is minus the gradient of the potential too, forever and ever. <laughs> okay, so in the previous lecture that you should watch if you haven't already, we derived the potential energies for uh, various conservative forces. And we use the equation that the work, if you're going to move a particle from position A to position B, the work done by a force F when you do that is, of course, equal to the integral from position A to, to position B of the force dotted with the displacement. And then you integrate over the path. Now, that's the definition of work, but then we added on to it that for a conservative force, this is also equal to the negative change in the potential energy. And then we used that to derive the potential energy function for conservative forces like springs and uh, universal gravitation, okay? Now, if you look at this equation, what we could do is we could look at the argument of the integral, okay? So basically we're saying then, before we integrate, that minus du, the differential, the negative differential change in the potential energy, negative du, is equal to uh, f dot dr, okay? So that's what we're saying there. Now that implies that if you take out and divide both sides by little dr, right, then the partial, the negative partial derivative of u with respect to r would be equal to the um, r component of the force, okay? So that's what that implies, all right? Now we can use this equation to go the other way. So in other words, we started with the equation for the force and found the potential energy going minus delta u is equal to the integral of f dot dr. But if we have u and we don't have f, then we could also do the negative partial derivative of u with respect to the component um, and use that to find the component of the force, okay? so. This is another approach. If you know the potential energy, you can get the force by taking the negative derivative of the potential energy with respect to a coordinate. Remember also uh, an important point from calculus. A partial derivative means that you treat any other variables other than the one that you're thinking about as constants. So if you have a partial with respect to x, and if you have some dependence on y and z, you treat y and z like a constant, and so the partial derivative with respect to x, something depending on y and z, would be zero. Okay, so never forget that important point from calculus about partial derivatives. It's actually easier, really, to take a partial derivative than it is to take a full derivative. Okay, so let's extend this um, equation that we just kind of really quickly showed here um, to a three-dimensional system. So let's imagine that we have a mass attached to a spring on all sides, kind of like those models that we were using extensively in earlier chapters of our textbook, Sherbet and Sherwood matter and interactions, right, where we were modeling a solid as little balls connected by little springs, where the balls the atoms and the springs are the bonds in between the atoms, okay? So if you think about an atom in the middle of that crystal, for example, it would have springs on all sides of it, okay? And so it would feel that spring force in all directions. So you might be able to, for example, if you wanted to be overly simplistic about it, write the uh, potential energy with respect to the neighboring atoms in this way. The potential energy would be one half times the x spring uh, constant k sub k sub x times x minus x naught squared plus one half k sub y times y minus y naught squared plus one half k sub z times z minus z naught squared. In other words, this is the potential energy for the spring, right, um, for each one of the springs in the x, y, and z directions respectively. Now, x naught, y naught, and z naught would be the equilibrium coordinate of your atom. And then any displacement from that, of course, um, would cause a force in that direction. 
Now, what force? Well, we could find the force in each direction using this potential energy. And what we would do is the x component of the force would be equal to the negative partial derivative of u with respect to x. The y component of the force would be the negative partial with respect to y. And the z component would be the negative partial of u with respect to z. Okay, so that's how we would find each one of the components in turn. Let's apply that here so we can kind of see how to do a simple example, okay? We know what the answer is going to be, but that's what makes this example kind of nice. We know where we're going to end up, and so we can see the power of the technique. So here's u repeated for you up there, so you can see what I'm taking my derivative of. Now, if I take the negative partial of u with respect to x, okay, that would give us our f sub x, our force component in the x direction. Now, that means that my y and the my z stuff, that is treated as a constant, and the derivative of that is 0. So I just have to worry about this 1 half case of x times x minus x not squared term. Okay? If I take the derivative of that, of course, 1 half and k sub x are constants. So those get, just get pulled out front. And then I have 2 times 1 half k sub x times x minus x naught. And then the negative sign comes from the negative partial. So that's what that is. Simplifying, I get minus kx times x minus x naught. And then, of course, I would get the exact same thing, kind of, you know, second verse, same as the first, repeated for the y and the z components. So my force in the y direction would be minus ky times y minus y naught. And my force in the z would be minus kz times z minus z naught. So that's our Hooke's Law equation back again. Okay, so we can see how these things are related. If we have the force, we can get the potential energy by integrating that dot product. If we've got the potential, we can get the force by taking the negative gradient. So, remember your gradient operator from vector calculus. All right, now I realize that this might cause unpleasant flashbacks for some of you, but you're in a physics course, so you can take it, okay? So your gradient operator, which is usually this little upside down triangle with a vector symbol over the top of it, oftentimes in some books, They'll make that uh, upside down triangle bold to indicate that it is a vector, but um, sometimes it's hard to tell what bold font is, so I like the arrow. So here we have the gradient operator would be the partial with respect to x in the i hat plus the partial with respect to y in the j hat plus the partial with respect to z in the k hat. Okay, so that's our gradient operator. All right, and then we can write our force equation very succinctly using this gradient operator. F is equal to minus grad u. Okay. The gradient operator supplies the vector part, which turns your potential energy into a force vector, right? So that's very important that you remember that notation. The force is minus the gradient of the potential. Okay. This is a generally true equation. All right. So it's very important that you remember it. Maybe you should chant it. Now, it's also important to remember for math, right, that your gradient operator in other coordinate systems isn't as happy smiley as it is in Cartesian coordinates, okay? Cartesian coordinates, happy smiley. Spherical and cylindrical coordinates, gradient operator, not so happy smiley. Here it is, okay? So the gradient operator in, in spherical coordinates, I'm sorry, is the grad is equal to partial with respect to our r hat, plus 1 over r times partial with respect to theta theta hat, plus 1 over r sine theta times partial with respect to phi phi hat, okay? So it's a little more complex. Now, you'll derive that, I hope, in your calculus class, right? That's the place for that. I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to leave that privilege to your calculus professor. In cylindrical coordinates, the gradient operator is partial with respect to r, r hat, plus 1 over r, partial with respect to phi, phi hat, plus 1 over uh, grad z, partial with, or partial with respect to z, z hat, sorry. Okay, so that's the gradient operator in cylindrical coordinates. A lot of my students in the past, on tests especially when they're freaking out, have written like partial with respect to r, r hat plus partial with respect to theta, theta hat plus partial with respect to phi, phi hat. And it's not right. Okay? The units don't work out for one thing. So just remember that when you switch over to other coordinate systems, your gradient operator is different. Okay? 
All right. Well, I'm going to stop there and keep it short and sweet. I hope you understood that and enjoyed it. And as always, I'll see you in class.